Tom Clark's 6M Podcast is a Boink Studios production. And now, on with the show. Hey, hey, what is up? Welcome to Tom Clark's 6M Podcast. I'm your host, Tom Clark. And in this episode, I'm joined by co-host, Phil Lindsay. John Wick is a bad dude. If anyone's seen any of the John Wick flicks, you know what I'm talking about, especially the the first part. To me, part one still stands above the the rest of the films. That's my opinion. Take or leave it. By the way, John Wick part one's in the archives, kids. (laughs) Go look it up. I felt compelled to tell you. John Wick's a bad dude. And, And the reason that that works is a lot of reasons that that works. But because he's so fluid, because it's so he never breaks a sweat, he never gets gassed or like gets out of breath. He the the fight comes to him. He knows exactly where to be, where to put his hands, where to put his feet. He's got awareness of the surroundings of the room that he's in. He knows what's going to happen. He can predict a guy's moves before they do them. It's almost Matrix style here with Keanu and John Wick, that kind of action guy. That stuff is fun to watch, man. I'm telling you. I don't know if any of it's real. I don't know if, like, if you could be a spectator in a real life, you know, war or battle like that, would would they be as smooth? Would they be as, you know, suit with the hair and the everything looks cool? I suppose maybe not. That's a guess. Don't know. Never saw John Wick in action. But again, this stuff can be cool. Just like the thing we're going to talk about here today. The Equalizer, Denzel Washington, smooth as silk, confident, sure of himself, can take care of himself against anybody, against any number of guys at any time, and his appearance is very unassuming. We'll get into it here today. But there's a lot of reasons why this works, just like there's a lot of reasons why John Wick works. It's the same thing, but it just as as there are a lot of uh, similarities, there are some differences here too, and we'll talk about that here today as well. But yes, we're going to dive into the Equalizer. We're going to talk about the character himself, and we may touch on a few other things along the way in terms of this franchise. We'll see where it takes us. In the meantime, let's hit it. The Equalizer is a 2014 American vigilante action film directed by Antoine Fuqua and written by Richard Wink. It is the first installment of the Equalizer trilogy and loosely based on the 1980s TV series of the same title. And when we say loosely based kids, we're not kidding. Trust me. The film stars Denzel Washington in the lead role, along with a variety and assorted cast characters in a story that is familiar. If you know action films, if you've ever seen a trauma in Hollywood, it's somewhat of a familiar story. All the actions here. The running time is 132 minutes. The budget is 55 to 73 million with a box office of $192.3 million. This one made some bank, kids. Released on September 7th, 2014. And September 26th, 2014, the United States. I can't believe it's been that long. And that is your lowdown for The Equalizer. So, Phil, as we get kicked off here today, let's talk about this film. Denzel was 60 when this film was made. It doesn't look 60 to me, dude. He looks sharp. He's in shape. He's getting it done. What do you think about this flick overall? It's interesting. It's been interesting watching Denzel uh, have this like revitalization of his career, if you want to call it revitalization. But this shift in his career as an action star, because for most of his career, he did like dramas or like suspense movies. Um, so to see him doing like action movies and doing like the like the fight scenes and like the fight choreography it's such a it's such a shift for what we know him from it is it's very much so do you buy it are you on board does it does his age take you out of it or what you knew him to be before does any of that mess with you at all no i i think he's convincing he's he's uh he's great in the role but um it's just not something that we're used to seeing him in it's kind of like when we saw training day um, if mm-hmm. you saw Training Day for the first time, he played a good guy for most of his career. And so seeing him be this dirty cop, it was just like, 
what's happening here? And it, <laughs> it's just, uh, of course, it's uh, it's indicative of how great he is as an actor that he can do so many things. He's so versatile. He is. Uh, he's convincing to me as well. I didn't get taken out of anything when I first saw this. And I think a lot of it, a lot of it for me, Phil, has to do with the way it's shot. A lot of uh, have the, how the action scenes play themselves out. Dude, he comes up against some pretty well-trained guys here. I suspect, at least they're supposed to be technically. He never feels outgunned or outmatched to be an all man. It feels like he's in total control of every fight scene. Yeah, I, it it feels like most of the fights are practical. Mm. Um, I I love how he does the bit where he sets his his, his uh, watch at the beginning of some of these fights, and he has it down to a science. And I think that's kind of that's kind of what makes all of this uh, so interesting to watch is that. Like it, this is a guy that, um, the old Batman adage with enough prep time, he could beat anybody. And it's kind of like this guy just comes into, uh, he comes into these fights prepared for everything. Okay. Well, listen, I mentioned John Wick out the gate. If we're going to go that far, who you got in a fight, John Wick or the equalizer? Uh, It's too hard, isn't it? (laughs) It's okay if you don't have an answer. I don't know that I have an answer. I was I thinking know. about this. I was thinking about this earlier today, and it occurred to it's one of those things. You know those questions like, "Who would you want to protect you?" Like, I kind of think I want the Equalizer to protect me because while John Wick is amazing at what he does, John Wick can get stabbed. Mm-hmm. Like we've we've seen him hurt badly, badly hurt. We never really see Equalizer get hurt that much at all. No, because he's he's ready for everything. Listen. Uh... I don't know. I you might have moments where John Wick is like not as motivated to help you out either. Uh, Equalizer's entire thing by the end of this movie is that he's trying to help people. John Wick is is out for revenge because some guys killed a dog. Hey man, I got a dog. Kill my dog, and I'm I might start wearing a a great suit and get some guns myself. You never can tell. And plus, I'd like to have his ride. Let's be honest, that car is awesome. <laughs> so. Yeah, uh, so Denzel plays Robert McCall. And again, as we said, loosely based on the show. Phil, did, have you ever checked out the TV show? No. Never seen it? Man. Never seen it. Well, let me tell you. It's not quite the same thing. <laughs> not quite the same thing. Uh, that That show had Edward Woodward in the starring role. Really, really good actor. Very good at what he did, British guy. But it was a very different tone, man. Very different tone. Same sort of, same sort of, you know, ideas. Like, you know, if if it's like the A team thing. If uh, if you have a problem, if no one else can help, and if you can find them, maybe you can hire the A team, right? Kind of the same thing. It's funny when I first heard about this film, I thought, well, it's just the name. I wonder how they cleared it. Did they did they buy the rights to the name or what? And then I found out it's based on loosely based and they're using the name Robert McCall and everything. So like, yeah. Is it, you know. is it similar to the new, uh, equalizer TV show with Queen Latifah? Queen Latifah is a take no prisoners, you know, take them all on. Did you ever check out the show? Cause I've never watched it. I've never seen the show, but every time I see clips from it, I can't help but laugh because it's like Queen Latifah as a vigilante. It just, <laughs> <laughs> so the action scenes I've seen, it just looks so weird. It just looks like it doesn't look real. It looks like almost like a parody of what somebody would think. <laughs> like an interesting TV show. And I should laugh because it, it might it might be all right, but every clip I've seen is really funny. See, uh, same here. I, I've seen bits and pieces from it, and I've not. Yeah, like she seems miscast. If I'm being yeah, honest, she does. Man, shout out to Queen Latifah, though, man. Queen Latifah has done some of everything. So, you know, has somehow made it into doing action as well. I mean, I can almost envision DeBrat being better in that role than Queen Latifah. Yeah. And Queen Latifah herself um, <laughs> is got to be over 50 at this point, right? She is 53 now. Wow. Yeah. So when that show debuted, she was 51, 50 or 50. Yeah. 51. So, yeah. I mean, you know, Denzel's got nine years on her for the start of start of this story. But, yeah, miscast, in my opinion. But Denzel's definitely not miscast here. You know, there's 
always been talk about, you know, recasting Bond, right? And I think the majority of people with a brain would all agree that Idris Elba was the perfect choice. And now Idris Elba is 71. I'm kidding. But, uh, you know, the longer we wait to cast this, the older ever, everyone's getting. So, like, why didn't we just pull the trigger, no pun intended, and cast Idris Elba? I mean, there was talk once upon a time of possibly Denzel, like mm. several, several years ago. I'm thinking, well, I'm not opposed to it, but he's not British. Would he be convincing? So, like, imagine how things may have may have turned in another direction. Yeah, they've they've got a few options now of British actors that could probably do it. That's true. Um, if you wanted, uh, if you wanted, to still go in that direction of casting a black man. So. Um, that's also British. Yeah, you've got a few options. You could, uh, um, Damson Idris would be pretty good. He's the kid from, uh, Snowfall. Uh, John Boyega also would be pretty good. Interesting. Yeah, Idris is older now. I personally think, um, it's probably past the point where you could do it. Um, I mean... Watch Luther. Luther is a fantastic TV show, and I feel like it's it's better than what we probably would get his, him as Bond at this point. It's on my to-watch list. I've never tackled it, believe it or not. It's definitely on my list of such things that show. I need to watch. Luther yeah. is such a good show, and they're, they're short seasons. It's not like they're all like 13 episode seasons, so you can get through it pretty quick. I'm going to have to do it. Yeah, it's definitely on my list. So, like we said, Denzel's convincing, gets the job done. I like the sound of this movie. I like the music. I like the vibe. Everything is, is you know, in terms of where they are and in terms of this Russian mob. And, and they, they give you just enough that you don't need to get lost in details and everything. But you got crooked cops. Again, you got the Russian mob. All the tropes sort of of, a, of an action flick. You know, you got sort of the, the trope of the, you know, there's one good cop. You know, the one good guy. And he's... He's working alone and even the cops are dirty and like, you know, he's doing all this work by himself. So like, but I didn't get hung up on any of that because it's typical action stuff, man. Like, was there any part of this plot or any part of this film that upon watching it again, that made you go, uh, yeah, I don't know if, I don't know if I'm, if I'm into that. <laughs> no, no, none of this really uh, took me out of it. I mean, yeah, some of the stuff is pretty cliche, but I enjoyed it. Yeah, I don't, I didn't really bump into anything at all. As we said, Denzel is Robert McCall. He's a former U.S. Marine and DIA officer, now living a quiet life in Baston. I felt the need to do that, where he works at a hardware store. Basically, it's a Lowe's Hardware Home Depot, right? He helps his colleague Ralphie train to become a security guard. Nice little um, sort of side storyline going on here. But yeah, before we go any farther, we got to give... Antoine Fuqua's shout out. You talk about a guy that's all right. Well, let's just read it off. The the film he began as a director was the Replacement Killers in '98. I mean, it's a good resume. The Replacement Killers, Bait, Training Day, Tears of the Sun, King Arthur, Shooter, Brooklyn's Finest, Olympus Has Fallen, The Equalizer, Southpaw, The Magnificent Seven, The Equalizer Two, Infinite, The Guilty, Bullet Train. Bullet Train's a great movie. Emancipation, The Equalizer 3, and he's got two more on the slate as well. And then he's also done some documentary films. So, yeah, this guy's uh, this guy's been in demand for a while, man. What did you think about the vibe of this movie and the feel of it overall? I liked it. It had that, that like, uh, gritty, kind of, like, noir feel, feel to it. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I liked the atmosphere of it. I liked the... Uh, I like the stark difference between like the stuff that's going on at night and like his day job. For whatever reason, I just enjoyed it. Like his him trying to have a regular job and make friends at work. Um, compared to like him like getting serious. Um, I think that's what I enjoyed the most about the movie is that he did have these moments like him trying to 
<laughs> trick his co-workers into thinking that he was going to pips at one point and doing like the <laughs> dad's routine and all this stuff was kind of like goofy it almost felt like uh bruce wayne trying to convince people like no don't don't pay attention to me i'm just nobody i'm just this goofy guy that works at a hardware store um and then he gets serious and it's just like oh no this guy's kind of terrifying cold blooded and as i said that word i wanted to say it like dev Chappelle doing rick james it just popped into my head but he cold-blooded man in the midst of all these fight scenes especially when he sits down across the table from this guy like what did you what do you see when you look at me and i'm thinking man if any dude looks at me this way i'm heading for the door like ice cold man to be honest with you denzel has the right temperament to play anything he wants to play because he's that effing good so it's kind of surprising phil to be honest with that he didn't get into action a lot earlier than what he did because again I, i i mentioned the bond stuff but aside from that i imagine the things he could have done earlier had he decided to get into this realm ahead of time yeah and i mean he's done other action movies but i mean when like when you just consider how much action he's doing in this movie it's like yeah him doing like the hand-to-hand stuff as well i mean i know like book of eli is, is an action movie as well for example but um it just feels different i don't know what it is it just feels different i guess maybe because he's doing most of the fight scenes yeah it looks really good i mean just and plus there was the one that um Bob Unkirk does this film called Nobody, and it's like it's it's very similar to the whole equalizer, you know, brand or motif. And I think that's one of the reasons why it got over as much as it did was because it it reminded people of another film they really enjoyed. So but yeah. Um I love the idea. I love the idea of again, this guy Robert McCall, he's very unassuming, looks like a normal working class Joe, and then it turns out you know, he's a former government agent, again, highly trained. I think there's something to be said for, and look, I, I, I enjoy Stallone and, and Schwarzenegger as much as the next guy in their prime, of course, and even today. But there's something to be said for a guy who's, the character is just completely in control the whole time. It doesn't mean he can't be killed. It just means that he knows of every possible way that you're going to try to do something before you do it. I think that's pretty cool. I think that adds to the stylism of this movie as well. Yeah, I agree. I think a part of what makes uh, the fight scene so believable is that a, a lot of the stuff he does, um, I don't want to say minimum effort, but he, he he makes everything look like it's well within uh, this character's um, range of motion and everything mm. you're not going to see this guy like jumping around and doing all these big like flips and all these other stuff he's uh only taking very precise and very it, none of this it, it's like it, none of this feels like he's like uh he's doing anything that looks like outlandish like lifting guys over his head and doing like these crazy feats of strength <laughs> or like all this crazy acrobatic stuff it it all looks like it's something that, you know, he can do for his age. Yeah, that's true. And like so like every time the camera backs up, it's not obviously a thirty year old stunt man who's ripped and <laughs> is yeah. agile and doing backflips. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. He's great here. I mean, as we record this, kids, there have been three movies released. I've seen part two, of course, but I have not checked out part three, although it got really, really good reviews. You were just talking to me uh, off mic before we started about maybe not even seeing part two, or do you, are you going to get caught up at some point and catch part two and three or no? Yeah, I, I definitely want to catch up so I can three, see three, but I think I've seen two, but for whatever reason, I just don't remember anything from this movie. <laughs> well, I mean, it's not like we don't watch a whole bunch of stuff all the time. Yeah. So let's talk about this cast here, kids. We've talked a lot about Denzel. The Bears repeating, he's effing great in this movie. And by the way, one of the greatest actors of our time, you'd have to say. I don't know if anybody disagree with that. If they disagree with that, obviously they don't watch movies too much. Effing great. Martin Kazakis as Teddy. This is your typical Russian villain. This guy has been in some stuff. He was Celeborn in Lord of the Rings. I may be pronounced, mispronouncing the character's name because I'm not a big Lord of the Rings guy, but he was in that. He was in Kingdom of Heaven. He was also in Aeon Flux. He's done some stuff. He was in Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter. Have you ever seen that movie? I have not. 
it's fun, but like there's a point in that movie when you're like, oh, that's it's over. That was a short film. And then it, <laughs> it goes on for another 45 minutes. And I'm like, yeah, it probably should have ended right there. Because it honestly felt like two movies kind of stuck together. It's very odd. What did you think about Martin here as Teddy? What do you think about this character as sort of being like the yin and yang to Robert McCall here? I like him. Um, the <laughs> Teddy is, uh, like you said, very stereotypical uh, Russian villain. Um, when he comes and he kills the one um, prostitute, and he does it, he does it with his bare hands, and it's so graphic. It's like, all, all right, I, I've seen this movie so so many times. So I, I every time I think of this movie, I think of him like choking this woman with his bare hands, and she's just like, "You're hurting me. <laughs> Let me go." It's very intense, man. It's hard to watch, too. It is. But he looks great. The tattoos that are all over his body and stuff, and he's he's cold as ice, man. He's cold as ice. Like, you just think about these two guys being trained by the individual governments, and one guy went one direction and one went the other, which is interesting. But then, like, McCall knows the story of this of this guy as a kid and this terrible thing that this dude did to his adoptive parents. So... That scene's pretty awesome, by the way. I really enjoyed that scene. Yeah. Yeah, he's great here, man. I, I love it. I think that he is, he's very good in this. Yeah, he's, he's uh, again, sort of the the yin to the to Robert McCall Jang. I think it's really well done. And plus, they send this guy in to sort of clean everything up and to find out who's behind the deaths of these Russian mobsters when, the truth of the matter is Robert McCall didn't have anything to do with these guys being monsters at all. He was just trying to get a bit of payback for Chloe Grace Moretz, who played Terry in this movie. So what do you think about this character? She and him form a bond very early on. You can tell the beginning of this movie, they're already familiar with each other. And the diner, like the, the film noir that you mentioned, which is a great, Great, uh, great call. That diner that he's always hanging out in is very cool, like with the city street right there, raining and whatnot. Nice aesthetic. What do you think about the relationship between him and Terry here? Uh, I like it. I feel like uh, we've <laughs> we've seen this dynamic in so many uh, movies like this, in so many comics. Like, I mean, that was the dynamic with Wolverine for years. He's got mm. like a female companion. Um. Or, I mean, Taxi Driver's another one. There's so many different characters that we've seen. It's like this, like, gruff, like, Dirty harry s character. And they have this companion as the complete opposite. This a woman. And I think they do a great job um, uh, getting us to believe that they have, like, this, like, friendship slash, like, um, I don't want to say father and daughter, but like almost like this uh this uh this you can see that he really cares about her and you can see that he wants to see her do better like he's very doting on her early on uh, don't eat too much sugar don't do this and um she clearly cares what he thinks um i like it a lot i think chloe is one of those actresses that um early on she showed a lot of promise and she was in a lot of movies very young and uh, I thought she did some great acting here. Oh, dude, I, I'm 100%. And we find out in this film that Alina is her actual name mm -hmm. and that she wants to be a singer. She's got these dreams, but unfortunately she's a call girl and she's in with the Russian mob and it's not a good thing for her. And that's what leads to basically McCall coming back from deep cover. We find out that he had faked his death and had gone underground and had let go of that life and had completely walked away from it. But then he is compelled to come back out. And like when when the when that happens and like he's confronting the 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 Russians outside, he always has that smile on his face. Again, Phil, he's in total control. I love the idea that he was struggling with doing this, with even helping her, because he knew if he did that he was turning his life upside down again. I love that they showed those moments of you can see that he's struggling. Like, should I do this? Should I actually do the right thing? But his whole motif feel through this whole film is like, you need to do the, you need to do the right thing. 
You need to, you know, step up. You need to make this right, make do the right thing. I love the idea that they showed him actually dealing with whether or not he should do it in the first place. Yeah, I I agree. Um, I mean, again, I don't I don't want to act like everything here is so stereotypical, but we've seen like this concept, this premise of uh, uh, the guy that is like uh, incredible at what he does and going into retirement. And then there's like this thing that is this driving force that forces him to get out of retirement. And it's just like getting back on a bike. He never forgot anything. Um, <laughs> right. um, but I, yeah, I, I enjoyed the, the ni- dynamic here. I enjoyed uh, him coming out of retirement. I enjoy how conf- conflicted he was about um, actually helping people. Um, but I like the idea that he had grown so close to Terry that that's what, uh, really forced him to make the decision. And the the spot where he walks into their club, into their restaurant, and he takes them out, there's like six or seven guys in that room, I think. One, two, three. It's like at least five or six. And when he sets them up, like you can tell the character is basically giving them a way out. He always gives these guys a way out. Like, you, I'm giving you a chance. Mm-hmm. Do the right thing. And of course, they're not going to do it. But dude, th- talk about this this scene where he sort of lays out the room, sets his watch. I mean, this sets the tone for who this character is, doesn't it? I, th- I think this is a great piece of filmmaking here, the way this is laid out. Yeah, definitely agree. Um, yeah, I, I just think that uh, they do such a great job of... Uh, of uh, staging these things like his uh his mood change and just the shift in the atmosphere and all of those things and i think that that is part of what makes this movie so interesting yeah i mean the way he can see a room the way he can lay things out when he's moving those skulls on the guy's desk and he's moving them to those spots for a, for a particular reason because he's going to use them as weapons to kill him later <laughs> yeah Oh my God! And he he offers him ninety eight hundred for the girl. And the guy's like, "You you you offer me nine thousand ninety eight hundred." He corrects him, which is really nice. I really enjoyed that. Yeah, he uh he's trying to basically buy the girl's freedom or buy you know, and the the dude's telling him that you know for a month you know you bring her back she'll and then she'll maybe well they'll use her up and then you can have her after that for free or whatever. Like the guy's a complete complete jerk the way he's talking to him, but. I love it. I love this idea of, again, this guy's in complete control of himself. He's in control of his surroundings. He knows what's around him. He's very observant. He notices everything. It's almost like time is slowing down. He gives himself like 16 seconds, and it takes like 28 to do what he's got to do in this room. And then you could see him doing the math afterward, like, well, nine, seven, eight, six. Yeah, he's like doing the math. It's funny, man. And plus, they they carry this with the character I know in the second film, I'm sure they do it in the third film as well, I assume. It's a nice little um, catch for the character, isn't it? It kind of sets him apart from your typical action guy that just grabs a gun and just starts firing away. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, it's uh, it's awesome. Let's also talk about David Harbour. David Harbour, uh, you it, it, guys, you probably know who David Harbour is. He plays a dirty cop. What? Frank Master is here. But man, he's very good. David Harbour's a really good actor, so like everything he does is on point. But what did you think about David Harbour's performance in this flick, dude? Um, I thought he was great. Um <laughs> he does play a dirty cop here. Um I I love that side story with uh with Robert that he uh convinces those dirty cops to go straight. Um because I mean, that's kind of the takeaway we're supposed to get by the end of the movie that he takes on all these odd jobs and he goes on like all of these like random misadventures. Um, and so I, I liked it that I like that side quest in this movie. <laughs> I was going to ask you about that. I like how you put that side quest. Yeah, because as the Russian thing is happening in the background, he decides to start putting his name out there, or at least his number, and he starts helping people that he finds out need help. I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. I'm assuming that was part of the concept of the TV show. It was, yeah. I think in the original TV show, his daughter was killed. So 
he decides to go after the people that did it. And in the process, it's kind of like the Batman thing where I'm going to help everybody that needs it. I don't want this to happen to anybody else kind of thing. Gotcha. Yeah. You know, it wasn't a bad show, man. I, I was a kid when it was on TV, but I remember my mom was a big fan. So I can't honestly tell you about anything. I just remember it was, I remember that I watched it, but I really don't remember a whole lot about it at all. Yeah. But I yeah, wasn't born once, when it came out. So. Oh, <laughs> shut up, Phil. <laughs> yeah, I get it. Uh, I, can't, I, don't, I don't know how old I was when the show came out. Let's see. But yeah, again, much different than uh, the movies we're getting here, obviously, and with good reason. So the Equalizer TV series ran from 1985 to 1989. I wasn't too much of a kid when it premiered in 85. Yeah, all right. I was 12 years old. But yeah, I uh, again much different, much different than um, than what you're seeing here today, folks. Hey, hey, kids! Tom Clark here, and did you know the very podcast you're listening to right now is available on BoinkStudios.com? B O I N K Boink Studios is the home of Tom Clark's main event, Tom Clark's Six M podcast, and Two Nations Under Ted, a Ted Lasso podcast. Visit the site today for links to every podcast platform, social media, special announcements, and a lot more. Check out the site and bookmark today, boinkstudios.com. We did Hellboy here on the on the 6M, but like we never, we had talked about the David Harbour Hellboy. Did you ever get around to watching that? I stepped in it. Yeah. <laughs> It's uh, it's got issues, man. It's got issues, not because of him. He's great in it. It's the story. Story wasn't working. To be honest with you, <laughs> some of the plot was just not there for obvious reasons. It tanked. So yeah, it's a shame. I was hoping that would take off. Really good cast, but yeah, it didn't didn't work. The prostitute you mentioned earlier that was killed very violently was uh, Haley Bennett. Uh, she's here also. Not much of a part, but what she does is fine. No worries. We've got Bill Pullman as Brian Plummer. Pullman doesn't have much of a role here, Phil. We don't see him that much in the movie. This might be an odd question, but like this technically could have been anybody. Why do you cast Pullman here? Is it because of his chops? What does he bring to the role that maybe this role needed, do you think? Or does it? I don't know because he's not in this movie that long. Um, mm -hmm. But I mean, it's good to see him because it's Bill Pullman. But uh, <laughs> like, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. You probably could have put anybody in that role. Honestly, I feel the same way. I feel like it's kind of a throwaway role. He does have more of a part to play in part two, by the way. Okay, but I don't want to ruin it for you in case you haven't seen it. Melissa Leo plays his wife, Susan Plummer, and she goes back. Uh, she has a history with Robert here, so that's sort of the connection that that is. They live out in the country. They live out so far in the country, Phil, a helicopter can pick her up and take her to work. <laughs> <laughs> My ride's here, guys. I'll see you later. I'll bring home Chinese with me for dinner. You know, that's pretty cool. Yeah. It, it, well, like I said, it is what it is. I mean, it's fine. The big bad of this movie, kids, is Vladimir Kulik. Actually, that's the actor. He portrays Vladimir Pushkin. Wasn't a whole lot of difference there, if I'm being real. Hmm. Yeah, he's not Russian. The actor is actually a Czech-Canadian actor. There you go. We don't see him, Phil. We hear his voice a lot, and then we see him in the last scene of this film. But again, dude, no disrespect to Mr. Kulik, but you probably could have cast... Anybody that could they could play the part in this role. So as I said, it's not really about him. But what? Do you, listen, let me ask you this: What do you think about the whole Russian mob thing in action flicks? Is this stuff just way too played out at this point, or no? That's a little. That's a little cliche. Uh, but I, I, I think what works about Vladimir, and of course Vladimir is a very cliche uh, Russian villain name. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> I think the other thing about Vladimir is that. He kind of fits the uh, action movie archetype where his henchmen or the guy that he brings in 
to go up against the main protagonist is more interesting than him. Hmm. Like how many times have we seen that in action movies where it's just like, oh no, the the main henchman is the cool one. The the actual boss, he's just he's just kind of just like a guy calling the shots. Yeah, it's kind of like um like Shockwave and Megatron, maybe. Yeah, I mean we've seen it in a bunch <laughs> of other things. Like uh like I mean, that's just think about when we talked about uh Beverly Hills Cop two. Um Bridget Nielsen's character is way more interesting than the actual boss is. Like <laughs> she's the actual cool one. Like she does all of the cool stuff. And Teddy's the, Teddy's the same way. He's actually like the cold and terrifying villain. Like uh Vladimir's just the kind of the guy that unleashed him. Yeah, good call. Good call. Yeah. It's worth mentioning here that one of the dirty cops is Robert Wahlberg. And yes, He's one of those Wahlbergs. That's why he kind of looks like Donnie Wahlberg and Mark because he's their brother. I actually had no idea about that. He's been in some stuff too. He was in Mystic River, The Departed, Gone Baby Gone. So he's not a new kid on the block. Is that what you're saying? He's ha! <laughs> I see what you did there. Yeah, I mean he could be a he could be one of the funky bunch. I'm not sure. It's always been my life's goal to be one of the funky bunch. It's it's on my to-do list, things I want to be when I grow up. So, How many Wahlbergs are there? There's like nine of them. <laughs> Let's see. For example, Robert Wahlberg is the brother of Arthur, Jim, Paul, Tracy, Michelle, Debbie, who's passed on, and Mark and Donnie. He also has three half siblings from his father's first marriage. These guys have family everywhere. Your dad was getting busy. <laughs> Holy Lord. All these Wahlbergs, too many Wahlbergs shake a stick at. However, that goes. Yeah, the other crooked cop was Timothy John Smith, who's been in Central Intelligence and also the judge. And a few other things. So there's your crooked cops. Not a not too much of a large cast here, Phil. It's like it's kind of like again I mentioned it about John Wick. It's kind of very reminiscent to me of that, where like the cast isn't very big, and they, there's there's not a lot of travel to a lot of places. They basically are the same places. I mean, you got the hardware store, Robert's apartment. You got the diner. You have Rush in the end. There's basically not many other places being visited here, man. That's kind of it. Yeah. I think that's an, a, another thing that works for this movie is that it, it's, um, for the most part, it's very self-contained. It's very, like, very small. Um, Like, it feels like, uh, even though he goes to that farm and they have that stuff, it all feels like it's, like, all, like, pretty contained into the city of Boston. Hmm. Yeah, that's fair. The first John Wick, by the way, was October 24th, 2014. And as we said, this movie, September 26th, so it beat it by a month, almost. Interesting. I had, Dude, if you quiz me, I would not have been able to tell you that these films came out in the same year. Yeah, I would not have guessed that that movie is almost 10 years old. Crazy, right? Yeah. So here's some production notes for you, kids. In June 2010, it was announced that Russell Crowe was trying to bring The Equalizer to the big screen, directed by Paul Haggis, with Crowe intended to play Robert McCall. And then, as is often the case, Phil, plans change. Things go in other directions. Could you have envisioned Russell Crowe in this role? Uh... Yeah, but I guess I'm so used to it now. I just can't unsee uh, Denzel. But yeah, I think he would have done well. Hmm. Maybe. I don't know. He's a really good actor, but it's definitely a different style. Different yeah. style. I don't know if I can envision Crow being the, you know, this is an odd comparison, but bear with me because it'll hopefully go somewhere. The whole idea of Steven Seagal's martial arts, number one, yes, it's a punchline at this point. I get it. But like one of the things that set his stuff apart from other guys like Van Damme was that his style of fighting was you let the opponent come to you. 
Yeah. And you basically are like working in a circle and you take on, you know what I mean? Instead of like running and ducking and flipping and kicking. So like Russell Crowe to me has always been more of a, you know, throw hard punches and, you know, get knocked down, have a busted lip. And then Denzel, by contrast, is again, I stand here. They come to me. I know what to do. I control myself, take control of my actions. But I guess, Phil, it all depends on how he's directed. But Crowe might have been fine. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, if Russell Crowe is doing anything, it should be a Nice Guys 2 movie. Why haven't we got this yet? Um, Shane Black, get to work on this. this Excellent question. What's the holdup, actually? They got Gosling doing that freaking Barbie flick. He can't come back and do this? Yeah. What's going on? Yeah. uh, Make Nice Guys 2. Come on, Shane Black. Man, get on it. We got to do the Nice Guys here on the show, dude. Yeah, excellent. Movie. It is an excellent movie. You gotta make that happen. I love talk about a movie that's got feel and got a vibe to it. Oh my god. Fun flick too. So evidently the script to the equalizer of uh, movie here, kids, it had no backstory about Robert. And I'm thinking, didn't you have the TV show? I mean, okay. So <laughs> Denzel contributed much of the character's background and story including McCall having obsessive compulsive disorder. Did you pick up that McCall has OCD? I can't say that I got that. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's one of those things that, uh, they don't outright say it. Hmm. Um, but yeah, you could, you could gather as much. Interesting. In addition to his daily physical and fight training before filming, Washington met interviewed several Real life OCD suffers in order to gain insights on how to play that disorder correctly. Very interesting. Yeah, that's Very that interesting. is interesting because I mean we don't get a lot of action heroes with OCD. That's that's fair. Monk, they're bringing Monk back. Did you see that? I did not. Yeah, he's coming back. I don't know why. I liked Monk. I can't say I saw a whole lot of them, but I liked what I saw. So yeah, they're bringing the show back. We'll see. Yeah, I never got into Monk. I like Tony Shalhoub quite a bit, but I can't sit here and tell you I binged a lot of Monk. I've seen some episodes, but it was never on my must-watch list for whatever reason. I liked him on Wings. I don't to this day. I don't understand why Wings got all the hate it got. I don't. I don't get it. I'm in the minority, I suppose. But man, it got some hate. But there was some good writing on that show. Very funny show. Not a lot of minorities on that show. Well, that's very <laughs> fair. Would you have to go bring that up for? <laughs> Yeah, dude, you're 100% right. But that's where um, I'm blanking on his name. That's where he got his start. Thomas Hayden Church. Yep. He was Lowell. Lowell was one of those TV characters like the Reverend Jim from Taxi, you know, or like uh, Kramer. One of those characters that sort of is a breakout character and like it gets bigger than every other cast member at the time. So, Oh, you mean like Urkel? Like how Urkel just basically took over the entire show? Yeah. Were you a, were you a Family Matters guy? I mean, who at one point who wasn't a Family Matters guy? It was one of the most I popular ne- TV shows of that era. I was never a Family Matters guy. I didn't hate it. I just I saw some, but I I didn't hate it. But like, I thought Carl Winslow was awesome, actually. Yeah, um, you know, there's some things that are not believable about it, like this uh, Chicago police officer that uh, was somehow okay with this guy uh, hanging around his house and hitting on his daughter all the time and destroying all of his property, and he wouldn't just like do something to get rid of him. You got hung up on that, but not the fact that Urkel created this machine that made him normal? No, I mean, but even before all of this, <laughs> like, how 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 was this police officer on his salary paying to get his house repaired all the time this guy tear up, tore up his house? Yeah. This guy, like, fell through the roof. Like, uh, didn't he, like, run his car through, like, the, the wall on <laughs> in their kitchen? Like he destroyed their, he just constantly destroying stuff, and somehow this cop, with uh, on a on a police officer's salary, was somehow fixing all these things, but couldn't pay for his daughter to go to, go to the college she wanted. Yeah, didn't, didn't believe that for us for a second. I mean, if someone's <laughs> if someone's tearing your house up, usually you just call a cop, get it took care of. Yeah, and he was a police. Okay. Yeah, that's true. That's very true. Here's something else. According to the director, during the research for the role 
As an underage escort, Chloe Grace Moretz interviewed real-life prostitutes. She met an escort who initially told her to gain weight because in that profession, in order to take care of different men, escorts had to have some flesh. Moretz, who was a minor at the time of filming, changed her diet and gained weight for the role. Method acting. Method acting. That's a detail <laughs> that I don't know if in my life I ever heard, and it's quite disturbing, actually. I did not know that she uh, did that, but, you know, you know, sometimes uh, the role calls for, calls for these things, man. Well, hey, do what you got to do, man, right? She fought for the role of Terry when she found out it was written for someone of 24. She presented herself so well, Antoine Fuqua immediately made the change. Yeah, I thought she was great. Same here. Yeah, Terry was originally written for an older actress. And, and uh, there you go. That, that explains the 24 deal. But again, Antoine was so impressed. Uh, she was 17-year-old when the film was released, but he loved her performance, so that's why he did it. This was Denzel's first trilogy slash movie series. First trilogy movie series. Yeah, that makes sense. He's because uh, again, he's not that kind of actor. He, d- he usually does the either the serious roles or like the one and dones. Like you know, when you think of uh, Denzel, he is a he's a movie star. Like he's not a guy that like is like a genre movie guy. He's not a TV actor. He's a movie star. He's, he's, I mean, he is what Nicolas Cage describes himself as, technically. Cage has done some genre stuff, but Cage just wants to be an actor. He doesn't care about, like, we've never seen Denzel in a, in a series before. He's a film actor. Yeah. Yeah, he's, uh, there, there, you know, it's, it's odd to ask this question, but like, is he, is he still held in the high regard that he deserves to be held? Because I'm, in my head, I'm trying to remember what was the last, when I say great, I'm talking about like an epic, like a Malcolm X type of movie where, you know, the critics are praising him and, and we're reminded this guy is spectacular. He's still held in that regard, isn't he? Is there is there any of that that's maybe worn off through the years? Or what do you think about that? No, I think he still is. I mean, he every now and then he'll do a, a serious movie that, you know, he does uh, remind you who he was. I thought he was fantastic in flight. Um, I actually thought he should have won Best Actor for Flight as well. Mm. God, Flight was 2012. Yeah. Uh, uh, when did Picket Fences come out? I believe he was in that as well. Fences was 2016. I said Picket Fences? I'm thinking of the TV show, not the, the movie. Fences. Oh, the I see. Man, I did watch that show. Picket Fences was the biggest show on TV for a long time. Or at least for couple, two, three years there it was. God, he was on St. Elsewhere. I forgot all about that. Yeah, at this, yeah Denzel at this point, he's he's a legend. He's a, he is a legend, 100%. He's a legend. He's 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 done it all. He's 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 uh done serious acting. He's done he's done his uh he's done his his stint with uh Spike Lee. He's done the he's done the suspense thrillers. He's done that is all, man. He's he's when you think of all of the role he's been in, Training Day, all of the Oscar award winning stuff he's done. Mm. Um, I mean, this guy has done a western. He's done it all, man. Mm-hmm. He's, he's done it all. Let's say that one day Marvel gets his attention. Who would you cast him as in the MCU? First of all, do you think he'd ever go that route? Do you see that uh, maybe happening for him? I don't see him ever doing a Marvel movie, honestly. Um, hmm. I think if he did, it probably would be kind of a one and done. I don't see him doing any like franchises. Um, mm. I think it's something I could see him doing. Interesting question. I don't know. I don't know if he would go the route of, you know, an African American Marvel character that's not been portrayed, or would you just, you know, cast him in a role despite um, anything like that and just cast him because it's freaking Denzel and he's great. I mean, you could honestly, you could do either or. I kind of like the idea of him showing up in something as like a one-off. It's kind of a gag, and it wouldn't even be some. It'd be like something that you least expect him to do, and he just do it once. Kind of like when uh Tom Cruise uh, what Tom Cruise would did with Tropic Thunder, where it's like, oh, okay, mm-hmm. um, 
Because I, I think that's his best chance of doing something like Marvel, where something like he would just do it for fun. I can't see him doing something like taking a lead role in one of these things. Mm. But I can see him like just showing up as a cameo or something in a Marvel movie. Or like Brad Pitt in Deadpool 2. Yeah. Yeah. I could I, I could definitely see Denzel doing something like that just out of fun to say, I, I did it. You know, my grandkid or something. Uh, thought it was cool so i did it for them right right yeah i would love to see his son do something for like marvel or like something mm. like that because he's i think he's a great actor as well yeah he's got uh he's got four kids um i'm of course speaking of john david washington john david yeah he's great Number in ballers he's uh great in uh uh what is it? What is the Nolan movie he's in with the time travel? Amsterdam in 2022, Tenet in 2020. Tenet. That's what I think of. He's great yeah. in Tenet. Yeah. Interesting. That might work. Denzel admitted in an interview he initially was reluctant to commit himself to this movie because of the difficulty of finding a director suited for the job. Although pleased that the end result was a box office hit, he made it no secret that he only made this movie due to contractual obligations. Very hmm. interesting. But then he went and made two more. I think it's because hmm. it did so well. Ah, uh, well, there you go. Good reason to make another one. Yeah, yeah. Make a nice little check on it. Not like he needs it, but, you know, hmm. why not? The watch worn by McCall is a Sunto Core, core All Black. However, the stopwatch display of the watch in the movie is not the same as in the actual Sunto Core sold commercially which combines an altimeter, barometer, and compass with weather information. When asked if this was a special edition of custom-made watch for the movie, Sento indicated that it was not, that more than likely the display on the watch was digitally altered for the movie during post-production. These little details like that are very intriguing to me, like because there's no real good reason why they chose to do that. Maybe for the sake of the camera, what the camera sees? I don't know. Interesting. Because yeah, that watch kind of becomes part of it, a big part of his character through the film. This uh, this film, like a lot of others, kids, languished in development hell for several years before it finally started production. It was originally developed by the Weinstein, Weinstein brothers in 20, 2005. They brought in novelists Michael Connolly and Terrell Lee to write the first script with Paul McGugan to direct. With no progress in 2010, the rights were then sold to Mace Newfield and Escape Artists. Paul Haggis was brought in to write another draft with Russell Crowe to play Robert However, other project commitments resulted in both men dropping out before Denzel saw the script and expressed interest in playing the lead character. I actually would like to see Denzel do more comedy now that I think about it. We've talked about the fact that he's done everything. But I would like mm -hmm. to see him do more comedy. I think he would be really good at it. He's never really done like a family film, has he? Uh, yeah. He did, uh, did The Preacher's Wife. Ah, I forgot all about that. The original of that film, The Bishop's Wife, is uh, basically a Christmas movie. Yeah, Preacher's Wife oh. is also a Christmas movie, isn't it? Yeah. I think so, yeah. Yeah. He, yeah, he's done other family movies. What are we talking about? He's done uh, Remember, Remember the Titans. Well, okay, yeah. I guess in my head I'm just thinking like a... You're yeah, do like that makes Daddy, sense. Daddy Daycare? <laughs> <laughs> You know what's funny is that I saw a new Eddie Murphy trailer yesterday, and so it's in it's knocking around in my head, and it's yet another family film. That's fine, Eddie. Whatever, whatever you want to do, brother. But like, I saw that trailer, and I'm like, oh, I'm ready to move on from Eddie and the Family movies. Maybe that's harsh. That's just me, though. It's over. That's his career now. It is his career, hundred percent. Yeah, that that's knocking around in my head. So yeah, in my head, I automatically went to went to that comparison. So they've made three of the Equalizer films here, Phil. I don't know what the plans are, if there's going to be a fourth. If part three made money, you know, you assume that you can keep this going. I don't know if the character dies in part three. I have no idea. I don't want spoiled form or anything like that. So we'll see. This movie could have just been a standalone, a one and done. It would have been fine. What do you think about this movie overall as like an action flick? Does it get the job done? Is there any plot points that are left? Is it too hokey in, in some scenes? Is it... Is it good as, you know, we get in, we do the thing, and we get out? What about overall as an action flick? I enjoy it. Um, I I think if you if you really try, you can poke holes in certain things, of course, because it's a movie. Um, but I, I enjoy it. Um, 
for whatever reason, I enjoy the setting of him being in a hardware store and trying to help people. It's such a <laughs> it's such a quaint idea, um, but it works. Um, like one of my favorite scenes in the movie is um, when that guy comes in and, and uh, sticks up the lady at the cash register, and she and he takes her ring, and he's sitting there the whole time with the, like the serious stare down, like. The rest of these people weren't here. <laughs> I would have stopped this by now. <laughs> like it's so it's so great, man. What, what? And you know what's cool about that is we never see what he does. Yeah, he just comes back with the ring later, and the sledgehammer that he's wiping clean with a towel. Yes. <sighs> yes. That poor kid. He's not a poor kid, but I'm saying whatever he did to him. Holy lord. <laughs> yeah, I, I just love their stare down when she when he's like telling her to take the ring off and he's just sitting there the whole time like like he's just fuming. <laughs> so good. You're right, because in his head he's thinking, I could have done this already. But like I I don't again, dude, this guy is supremely confident. To have this much confidence, he's like a ninja. <laughs> like a like a just a, like, you know what I mean? Like he just you can't rattle him. You can never rattle this character, dude. It's impossible. Yeah. Um yeah, I mean there are other cool things. Scenes like um, when a guy tried to kill him in this um apartment, and he's uh he's uh tending to the nick on his leg where he got shot, mm-hmm. and you know he just he just like very calmly f- fixes it up and handles his business. <laughs> like just go straight, go straight back to uh being calm and collected. It's great. He never he never looks like he's worried. Nothing. <laughs> Never looks rattled at all, like you said. Um, also, like the the scene towards the end where he where he uh, he kills all the all those guys um, and and uh, tricks the guy into electrocuting himself and go just goes back to his regular life. <laughs> yeah, like I said, you can't rattle him. I mean, it's like the scene where where this guy Teddy is coming up the stairs. He knows someone's coming up the stairs in the room. And he sees the keys shaking on the ring on the wall. Like, again, dude, dude's a ninja, man. Like, effing great. Really good stuff. Yeah, you can't rattle him. It's impossible to rattle him. That's why you can't beat him. I like the bait and switch of him not being in the apartment. He's in the building across the street. Yeah. Yeah, it was a cool scene. That was nice, too. I'm okay with uh, with the director messing with me as long as it's a good reveal and not something terrible or heinous. So, yeah. Well, there you have it, kids. There is the equalizer. As a standalone flick, it works. It's got everything you need. It's got a damsel in distress. It's got a a hero that's unshaken, that is here to do the right thing. It's got villains that are very, very hateable with no redeeming qualities whatsoever. And it's got dirty cops and a bunch of cool action. I will say that David Harbour's character did get a modicum of some sort of redemption. Although you imagine he'll be spending the next 30 years in prison, maybe more. I suspect at least we got something. So Phil, let's, let's see if we can put a bow on this. What do you think? Give me your last word on the equalizer. It's a equalizer is a really enjoyable film. Um, I think if you're looking for a franchise that just like easy kind of popcorn movies, I think that this fits the bill again, doesn't really, not what you would think of when you think of Denzel Washington because he has such a stellar reputation. Uh, but I think he brings a lot to this role. Uh, very surprising that this was one of his uh, contractually obligated movies, but it never feels like he phoned it in at all. No, it does not. It feels, yeah, he's on point. He's When Denzel does Denzel stuff, He's no one no one can touch him. I'm, again, he's one of the best actors of our time, 100%. Professional, man. He's not going to come in and phone it in. You're right. One of the best totally. actors of our time. Not even one of the best actors of our time. One of the best actors ever. I agree. Talk. I mean, he's a guy that looks like, you know, like the sophisticated actor from like the, the 60s and 70s when all guys still wore ties and carried themselves in such a way. That's what he reminds me of, like an old soul kind of guy. Yeah, he's still very much old Hollywood. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. yeah. He's he's uh he's old Hollywood before the days where the IP sells the movie. And... You know, you're going there for the genre flicks. You're no. Th- th- it used to be a day when names sold the movie, and Denzel's mm-hmm. still one of those guys. That's why I'm like, he's a movie star. He's 
It's not just like somebody you just throw in a movie for no reason. You don't just go and get Denzel because you can go get Denzel. Mm, yeah, 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 yeah. And plus, it's Denzel. Like, I mean, when you say the name Michael, you're probably, I mean, the first name that comes to my mind is Jordan. I can't, there's a lot of other Michaels out there, but if you say the name Michael to me, I, you know, Denzel, obviously, because Denzel is a unique name, but like, yeah, again, like you said, banking on the name to to sell the film, and man, he. But once it gets you in the theater, like you, you're happy you're there. Really good guy, man. Really, and like those interviews that he's gave over the years about actors and trying to keep it in perspective, it's excellent. I've seen him at a round table full of other actors who probably have been pretentious at any given time in their careers, and he brings everybody down to earth really quick. It's excellent watch. Yeah, I think that's one of the most fascinating things about him is that guy's been around for as long as he has had had amazing uh career that he's had but he still seems so down to earth um that clip that always pops up on twitter of him doing an interview with jamie fox and he's talking about going to dinner and he's like yeah well lost that award but uh came out and i saw uh, there were like some trays with like some plates of food and he was like huh well I'm leaving here with something. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm from around the way. Leaving here with something. <laughs> <laughs> That's really good, man. That's really good. Yeah. The more I think about it, the more he should do a comedy, man. Come on. Yeah, I think it would be great. I'm sure that uh, a part of him, you know, you got to be very careful with the roles you pick, especially as a black actor, because, you know, you don't want to get typecast. Uh, but I think mm-hmm. at this point he had the autonomy that to, you know, to pick the roles that he wants and to be, um, you know, he could be whoever he wants to be. He's still, still watch it. Yeah. Oh, dude, for real. Yeah. Believe it or not, we've never done any of his work here on the show. Yeah. I mean, what a vast, uh, career there's so many things that you can pick for him like Mm -hmm. i said this guy's done everything we really think about he's done he's done just about everything yeah oh dude yeah yeah well kids now we can say we've done a denzel joint we will do more i promise you because like phil said there's a whole lot more to talk about so stay tuned for that we'll see what we can get into remember the titans would be a good one uh, Malcolm X would be interesting to do. I'd like to tackle that. There's a lot of other stuff. I actually thought, believe it or not, I didn't hate Ricochet at all. It was, uh, you know, it has moments of John Lithgow as the villain is something no one really expected, but I thought he pulled it <laughs> off. <laughs> I liked it because it wasn't something he typically does, but man, he's twisted in that movie, man. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, the interesting movie. It is. Yeah. Very interesting. Well, stay tuned for that, kids. We'll see what else we can get into soon with Mr. Washington. In the meantime, that is The Equalizer. Hey, thanks for listening to the show. Check out our social media on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at 6M Podcast. We'll see you next time.